is. Um, we're going to spend uh, today with assessment and just stay with assessment instead of break off because I th maybe that's maybe that's you know we break in the middle of a sentence and we start a whole different thing. Uh, so I, we're just going to stay with assessment today and then we're going to do uh, Thursday will be uh, biological and, and and do it that way. Uh, devote a, a whole session instead of instead of breaking it off in the middle because maybe that's kind of a mental insult. Uh, to stop it like that. So what we're going to do is continue with that. Gang, <clears throat> we've been talking about assessment in general. Motivational interviewing as a part of the assessment process. Of course, motivational interviewing. In other words, the postures you will hold as you are interacting with this individual in a way to be able to not only get the information you need. You need information. And there are two levels of information you need. Number one level is just the stuff you need for the official paperwork and the insurance company and all that kind of stuff. You need to do all that stuff. And yeah, this is when you're going to be doing that and getting. And, and then the, uh, the canned forms and things like that, uh, get that information and get that out of the way. And that's where the problem is. People see assessment as just that. Let's get this stupid paperwork, all this formal shit out of the way so we can do real counseling. That's, so that's one thing you got to get that <coughs> taken care of, and then the second, a very important other thing is what? Then just to get the information you need about this client, get the information you need about this client, not for the formal paperwork and the insurance forms and all that, but the information you begin the the, <coughs> the, the, the discovery of who this person is. And again, all this stuff we talked about last semester, as you're looking for, as you're trying to discover, hey, process to the product stuff. Who is this person? How did they? What childhood stuff? I mean, remember, what did I say? Probably right now, it's been about nine years, 10 years ago now probably, probably right now there's a counselor who would love to know about what happened that day at McDonald's with that little baby. They would learn a lot about who that person is today if they knew about that kind of stuff. Finding out as much as you can, process to the product. In other words, who is this person? How did they? What were the trials, the tribulations, the challenges, the this, the that, the good, the bad, and everything else? What were the things, the events <coughs> of their life that has shaped who they are today as they sit there with you? Again, that process to the product stuff. Find out who this person is. Find out what did they have to encounter, endure, and how that shaped who this person is today. Your ability to move beyond, what did I say? Don't forget, move beyond the official paperwork. That's where you're going to have the diagnosis. Somewhere, probably several places. The, the official diagnosis. That nomothetic level label. What is this person's diagnosis? But you need to go beyond that. Remember, you move beyond that from the old diagnosis to the what was that? What do we call it? The case conceptualization. The case conceptualization. The formal paperwork then tells you very little about what you need to know as a person who's going to enjoin a relationship with this individual in a way that you're going to help them. And that means move from the nomothetic diagnosis to that what? Ideographic case conceptualization. That your ability to really get to know who is this person? How did it? What did they encounter? What are the major events of their, what, what is this all about? How did they become who they are? And that all <coughs> the time sitting there with you. And again, gang, you know, yeah, it's the now. Who is this person now? But the best way to know that is to find out how they got there. And that passed that way. Another very important part of this from last semester, you need to know this stuff, is the learning, their learning history, classical conditioning, operant conditioning. Don't forget the power of classical conditioning all by itself. Throw in with that the two-factor theory, what classical conditioning combined with operant conditioning. How, how and why are what reinforcers for this individual right now? What are they doing? Why are they doing what they're doing? What is paying off that behavior? We don't just do shit for the hell of it. Everything we do, there's a reason for it. Somehow, some way. You have to get into and understand this person well enough to understand what are the reinforcers. And again, what those reinforcers are. 
What do I mean by reinforcers? What are the things that are promoting and maintaining the current behaviors? Those reinforcers. What are the things that are promoting re and maintaining those current behaviors? And as you start to discover, don't number one, they're not going to walk around with a big placard. Here's my reinforcers. You're going to have to get into and know this person. That's why you need to understand that process to the product. Because what often turns out to be the reinforcers for who this person is today and why they're doing and continuing to do what they're doing are going to be real different than what you may expect. Once again, when we meet that person, and again, it does. I'm going to put this up here. Once again, guys, yeah. You would look at this person and think, what the hell is reinforcing about what this person's doing? Nobody would give them a decent marker. Let me, I got me. one in my bag if you want it. Yeah, a good one? Yep. Just for you. Well, don't, thank you, thank you. Don't give them shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gang, you look at this, and once again, Apparently. I mean, these can be pretty damn severe. Thank you, that's much better. These can be pretty damn severe. And you're sitting there, why the hell? What is reinforcing about this? This is where counselors make a mistake. Don't make this mistake. They focus on this. Which means that it does look so damn stupid, out of control, insane, whatever adjective you want to use to describe in a negative way who that person is and what they're doing. And it doesn't make sense. No, this doesn't make sense. We don't ruin our lives for the feel good of it, for the fun of it. And when we focus on that, we're not going to see through that. All we see is, what do you mean? There's nothing reinforcing about this. This person. And, and they're incurring those losses, including family, children, this and that. They just don't give a shit. You've got to move beyond that. Understanding, one of the most important tasks early on, as soon as you can, understanding what are the reinforcers. I know it looks nuts, crazy, out of control, insane. This person doing some real stupid shit and they're paying a real high price for doing stupid shit which looks even more stupid on the surface. Do you see what I'm saying with this? You've got to get past that. You've got to realize that negative reinforcement. And what is that? The power of negative reinforcement. In your assessment, you guys, moving beyond just that nomothetic diagnosis. That's just a label the insurance company needs. Or whatever funder, something like that. That's the label that gets them through the door, that official diagnosis. You need to do this case conceptualization. Understand that person that way and understand one of the most important things, the power of negative reinforcement. Whatever this person is getting up here, this is what you need to look for right here. We know this. Yeah, drug to fun. The brain loves drugs. It lights up the pleasure center. And then we do stupid shit because we're dumbasses. And we don't give a shit about anything or anybody. No. that You focus on that gang, you're never going to see what you need to see. We don't. I, I don't care how <coughs> wrong, bad, costly, self-defeating, or anything else that looks on the surface. That person is doing what they're doing because they're getting something for it that is still worth the price they are paying. You've got to find that. And it's not going to be obvious. And it could sometimes be the last thing you would think. And usually that stuff is going to be one way or another. What? It's going to be escape avoidance. That brain is built in a way. The only reason why we're here today is escape avoidance. Do you see what I'm saying with that? we got the fuck out of bad situations. Nothing else matter than get out of danger. All the good things of life and everything else, none of that's going to matter if you're tiger lunch. Let that tiger be a metaphor for whatever danger. The problem is, you guys, what you got to look for 
is that very often the tigers, this is the key to this, the tigers, this person battling today, are the tigers created via their way of thinking, their perception, their integration of this stuff in a way that they turn whatever it may be in life. And life can suck. Life can be bad and a disappointment and a tragedy and a loss and, and a pain and things like that. But whatever, and even so, I mean, good stuff, this stuff, that, whatever, disappointment. Anxiety over what could be, might be. All those, what are the tigers? What are the tigers in this person's life? One of the best ways to start to be able to see those tigers is to understand that they're processed to the product. Do you see what I'm saying? Why is this person taking this situation? It doesn't have to be that big a deal, but by the time they're done with it, it's the worst possible awful thing. I'm done, I quit, I'm, I'm not good, I'm not, or whatever. And, and then that becomes a tiger for that person. You, you've got to understand that. We are tiger makers. And in your assessment, that case conceptualization, by going to the past, you're going to, how, why is this? You're going to think to yourself, this is the silliest, damn stupid thing. You're ruining your life over what? Your, your, you see what I'm saying with this? To that person, it's worth it. Why? Because they have now mentally, emotionally machinated that into a tiger. And once that tiger is there, we will pay a very high price to get away from or defeat that tiger because if you don't, nothing else matters anyway. When you sit there and try and focus on, look what you're losing here. Yeah, you're gonna assess this. You're going to assess what is this costing this person? What is the loss, the cost and stuff in their life? But when you just focus on this alone, and then try and illustrate. You see how stupid this is. You're not going to get far. It just makes such good sense if you can just get this person to see this terrible cost they're paying. But somehow or another, they stubbornly, they won't see that cost. Or even if they do, they don't care. Or even if they care, they feel helpless against that situation anyway. And, well, guess what? Those are all tigers. This is worth it, not because they are so shallow that they just want to have fun. It's because they're getting something for it that's making it worth more than they're paying for it, no matter how atrocious that cost may be. You've got to find out what that is. And gang, Another mistake when we focus on this cost thing, and this is where, and I heard several people this semester already talk about, and they keep going back to, yeah, but it wasn't worth it because of, well, I get the cost. That, that, I, no, gang, it was still worth it. This, it's tricky. These are going to be very unique, idiosyncratic. Again, I'm sitting there thinking, what the fuck? It, it, you're, you're what? To that person. It's a tiger. The other problem with focusing on, and, and, and they start writing an assessment instead of trying to find out who this person is in a way that they can actually work with this person, they start to shove this down their throat from the very start and figure that somehow or another that's going to motivate them to want to change. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't work. Of course, whenever we meet that end, it doesn't work. Well, what happens to us? then we end up turning our client into a tiger and now we're all pissed off and now instead of us trying to solve a problem here, we're just trying to win our own battle against now our client who is a tiger. Mm -hmm. And then that goes wrong. Another problem with focusing on these negatives is, well, what is it called? Acquired hedonic cost habituation syndrome. Ah, and I've talked to you guys about that. That thing I invented to understand this. And this is where, to once again, put this into that contextual perspective. Acquired hedonic cost habituation syndrome. What happened? Again, parents, teachers, probation officers, 
partners, spouses, best friends, they keep focusing on, if I can only get this person to finally see how bad this is, they'll get their head out of their ass and stop it. The problem is, acquired. What do I mean by acquired? This is learned in. Hedonic cost, hedonism, feel-goodism, the stuff of life. Don't forget, you guys, this individual, they want the good stuff of life just like everybody else. They want the good stuff of life just like everybody else. They want to feel good about themselves. They want to have a sense of potential, accomplishment. They want to have a sense of love and being loved. They want to have a sense of direction. They want to have, just like everybody else. And then that's what looks so damn stupid. Yeah, that's what you say you want, but you keep throwing it away because you're so, such a just shallow, cheap ass. All you want to do is get high. Get loaded. That's what the problem is here. You always do is just shut up on everything. Let me show you all this bad stuff so that you would finally realize, damn it, damn you for being such a stubborn client. Guys, this is going on right now. I, maybe, yeah, and, and I know I'm paraphrasing and I'm, I'm acting that in a superlative way, but the fact is this, is this dynamic is going on with this person. Let me finish this thought, then I'll get your hand. The thing is, acquired hedonic cost, hedonism, that is built into, don't forget that brain that I learned a long time ago, if it feels good, it's good for you, love it. Love it a lot, do it a lot, that kind of a thing like that. Which is the, the physiological problem with the drug. It does feel good. But this person's paying a whole lot of other feel-good price for that. Do you see what I'm saying? We're not that stupid, you guys. If we were so stupid as a species, we humble little humans in this big universe. If we were so stupid as a species that we were willing to throw everything away <laughs> just for a, a quick physiological feel-good like that, we wouldn't be here talking about it today. We would have killed, died out a long time ago. We would have never survived. We don't ruin our lives just for the fun of it. We're paying this price. Acquired hedonic cost. Habituation. And that's the key to it. Acquired hedonic. <coughs> this person has learned how to not feel this loss. Do you understand what I'm saying with that? You ever think about this for a minute? Is, is anybody, and you don't have to self disclose, are there any retail therapy uh, people in the. Yeah. Uh, retail? <laughs> All right. I mean, I, you know what? Probably <coughs> at, some, at some time, right? Retail therapy? Is there anything you're feeling bad, you're having a bad day, anything, you know, just, it's not that you're about ready to hang yourself, oh, but it's just that. And, and buying That's something can feel so good, can't it? Oh, for sure. And that kind mm -hmm. of thing like that. And you're sitting there, you're sitting there, and you know what, first of all, I don't really need this, I really don't have the money to pay that much for this thing that I, but somehow or another, you end up convincing yourself it's worth it, don't you? Yeah. You talk yourself out of the cost, don't you? Mm -hmm. You can get, uh, you can get good at doing that. Do mm -hmm. you understand what, pretty soon. And what did you get for that? What did you, you pay that price, what did you get? A sense of, for whether it's just a brief little time or maybe you, you got a sense of escape and avoidance from that which was ailing or bothering you. And you did something nice and you didn't. You see what I'm saying with that? And no matter how much you felt, and you, I see lots of recognition faces right now. You know what I'm talking yeah, about. Not me. You see, what, got, you see what I'm saying? Cheap. And if you oh, keep doing it. that, pretty oh. soon it becomes easier and easier to shell out that money for another quick fix. Study. Retail therapy. That I mean, you see what I'm saying with this stuff, you guys. It becomes easier and easier. You get so good sometimes at justifying and rationalizing why, once again, I really don't need the damn thing. I really don't have any business spending money on the damn thing I don't need right now, but somewhere or another you talk yourself into it. And you get better and better at that. I can see recognition on people's faces. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what you're doing is habituating on the cost of that quick fix. This person has habituated on this loss. Yes, I, I mean, what normal person 
Again, from that first major hangover to now losing the kids, losing the spouse, you losing this, losing, and, and all the other loss. And at some point, even health issues and things like that. What normal person isn't going to be upset about this? Why doesn't that work? Because they have habituated on that cost. They have learned how to not feel that cost. Do you understand what I'm saying? Otherwise, they would never be able to tolerate if they didn't learn how to. And that's where this part of the Hibana got. This is the cognitive dissonance. I got dissonance. I'm about to do something I know it's going to cost me more than I really want to pay or can afford. How do I justify it? How do I rationalize it? How do I explain it to myself? How do I make it okay after all? You see what I'm saying with this, you guys? And then they learn how to do that and it becomes better and better. And what have I always said? The more you do it, the better you get, the better you get, the easier it is, the easier it is, the more you do. And this person, and for this person, all this loss. We're looking at a human being who ought to be upset about all this loss. They don't seem so damn upset about that loss. And now we're mad at them because, you know, one of those losses is your kids, you fucking asshole. You don't fucking care about your kids either. Is that what I'm... And it's, it's going to be real quick and easy to get real mad at that person. You see what I'm saying with this? The problem is, acquired and I cost habituation, in other words. This doesn't feel that bad anymore to that person. They have learned how to have that not feel so bad anymore. So when we try and use that as a way to make them feel bad enough to change, that's not going to work. Does that make sense? Do you hear what I'm saying with this? Do they do that through cognitive dissonance resolution? Yes, they, okay. all the different kinds of ways. How can I justify it? How can I this? How can I that? It really wasn't that important to begin with, all that kind of stuff. Well, no, but they, they, they justify however they do for themselves to justify that next step in that decision-making process. And again, I mean, retail therapy is the same thing. Do you see the connection here? <laughs> you, you know, people do. That can be a pretty serious, serious, serious problem in a person's life. All People go broke. People go into serious ass debt via retail therapy. At some point, when their next credit card bill has a skull and crossbones on the front of it, you would think that that would be, maybe I, but somehow or another they keep doing it and keep doing it. Why? Why? Because what they're getting. Every time they do that and they get something. And oh, by the way, where's the last thing they bought that felt so good for the, for an hour and a half? So in the closet. And you see what I'm saying with this stuff? The reason why I'm talking about retail therapy right now is because do, do you see the parallel with what we're talking about here? And counselors, and we spend so much time trying to convince that person via their loss, their cost. If I can just help make this feel bad enough, that will somehow or another motivate that person to change. Do you see what I'm saying with that? The problem is you're probably going to fight a losing battle there because this person has gotten real good at not feeling that loss. Acquired hedonic cost. In other words, it's costing you feeling good in that way. Hedonic cost. Acquired hedonic cost habituation. They have habituated on that loss and on that pain. It doesn't feel that bad anymore. And it's not that they don't care about their kids. It's not that they don't grieve the loss of that relationship. It's not that they don't give a damn about this. It's that they have learned how to not let that interfere with their ability to do what they really truly believe they really need to do, and that is what? Get away from the tigers. Does that make sense? They have convinced themselves. And again, this is a matter of the more you do it, the better you get. Whatever these things are, whatever these things are, whatever. And again, the cognitive dissonance, resolution. What's another name we give this circle up here? The addiction survival. Addiction survival. 
persona with this stuff. This, all of the, hey, the common things, of course, denial and, and rationalization and minimization. And what, whatever it is with that particular person, how they have learned how to, if you will, have their cake and eat it too. The problem, and this is what you got to remember, with that dynamic, is when we try and focus on this loss as a way to motivate that person out of that addiction, we're usually going to not succeed. They have already learned how to not feel that loss. I'm looking at, I'm looking at your life. Whether once again a parent, a teacher, a counselor who doesn't know better, should know better, but doesn't. I'm looking at that and thinking, this is awful. Look at this horrible mess you have. You don't seem to care. And boy, that pisses us off too, doesn't it? I'll give you something to care about, you little chef. But we, we see that horrendous mess they have in their life now. And it's getting worse all the time. And they don't seem to care. And we're saying, what the fuck is wrong with you? Do you see what I'm saying with that? Do you get the parallel with retail therapy? When we focus on this as a motivator, we're usually going to fail because that person has learned. I don't have to feel this anymore. Does that make sense? And so acquired hedonic cost habituation syndrome. And what that means is it starts to manifest itself in all aspects of this person's now addiction survival persona. You have got to find out what this is all about. You have to find out what is making this worth it what is what are those reinforcers that are so important to this person it's worth all the trouble it's going to take to learn how to not feel lost in the first place see what i'm saying that's damn hard work learning how not to feel lost is damn hard work what what is what are they getting for this that's making it worth it that's what we got to focus on is that client going to walk around with a placard with that? Here's what I'm getting for making it worth that. This is what it is. Just help me with it. No. They may not know themselves. Don't forget classical conditioning and some of that other stuff. That brain is just working auto. It becomes even more difficult when these tigers are not even real tigers. They are the tigers we have conjured via our experience and the way we think about and give meaning to that experience. How we take life. And life can be a real pain in the ass and suck sometimes. We all know that. But whatever it is, by the time we get done thinking about it, it's even worse. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's even... And then we start anticipatory... And because this is going on, here's the awful next thing that's going to happen. Oh, here's another one. And because this is going on, here's what it really truly means about me. I'm just a big dumbass worthless piece of shit. Boy, that's a lot of fun to think about that today. There becomes another tiger. There becomes another tiger. You know, it's like when we talk about it. I'm going to give you another example of this. We're going to look at, we're going to look at the ABC, very simple, ABC model of cognitive therapy next semester. This is what you guys need to be assessing, looking at. Way beyond just that happy little label and what was the first time you drank and how many times have you blacked out. Yeah, you gotta get that information and yeah, it's gonna be in some stupid form and some of <coughs> is gonna be there. But that, you need to know this. Do you understand what I'm saying? By the way, right now before I forget and you do too, what, you had a hand up and you had a question. Yeah, it was just basically just trying to get some clarification on uh, the acquired hedonic cost and then that you had went and said acquired hedonic 
cost, the habituation syndrome, right. and then you was talking about hedonism. What is actually hedonic? Hedonic. Hedonic. Hedonism. Hedonism, hedonism is feel goodism. Okay. Doing things that feel good. In other words, hedonism, the good things of life. I know that hedonism sometimes gets a negative kind of a connotation, oh, you're just a big hedonist. But to that old brain, hedonism means what? The good stuff of life, being alive, feeling good about it, and, and successfully doing that kind of stuff. So uh, acquired, in other words, it's learned in. This person learns how to do this. Hedonic cost. In other words, I'm some or another, I'm costing myself good stuff here. But then I habituate on that. It doesn't feel so bad anymore. Right. I'm the counselor trying to tell you how awful this is. Why doesn't that make you quit? And you're looking at that. It doesn't feel that bad anymore to that person. And that's what you say. As a counselor, do not keep focusing on how bad this client's addiction is. No, no. Don't focus on how bad those consequences are. Okay, consequences are thinking then the client will stop doing what they are doing because they won't stop. That's no, not why? Going to make them because stop. they have learned how not to feel bad about that stuff anymore. Right. And I said, clients saying, have learned to justify and rationalize their pain. Exactly. Extremely high cost of their actions and continue doing the behavior learned how not to feel their loss. That's exactly right. They have learned how not. This doesn't feel that bad anymore to that person. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't feel that bad anymore to that person. I'm sitting there looking at your life as a complete fucking train wreck. Well, how, how do you, how does this not bother you? And again, you counselors, that's when you had better have a real, real good handle on your own tiger making. I'm sitting there trying, what the fuck is wrong with you? Anytime a counselor asks themselves about a client that way, or sometimes they just say it right out to the client, what the fuck is wrong with you? What that means to me is you have a counselor who has no fucking idea what they're doing. You understand what I'm saying with that? But on the surface, it does. Look at this. Look what you're paying for. Look, this is so damn stupid. And so, how can... How are you okay? You ever ask that? How is it okay with you that you lost that? How do you not fucking feel bad about that? And all of those are all real stupid questions. That counselor who doesn't... The reason why is because they have to learn how not to feel that bad about that. How could they... I mean, if you think about it. If every day I'm sitting here... First of all, just the hassle of maintaining my drug supply every day and staying in there. And now on top of that, i got to feel and take responsibility and, 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 and suffer that pain. No, this person learns how not to feel that stuff. And when we try and focus on that, then as a way to motivate that client, To want to change, we're going to usually meet with a failure in that task. And what a waste of limited time already doing that. There you go. I mean. What you need to do is find it. And gang, what is, instead of focusing on this, what you need to focus on is this. <laughs> hey, keep that off. I'm excited about curls. Instead of focusing on this, you guys, you need to start really looking at this. Do you see the difference? Yes. Okay, now, you as a counselor, not on drugs, knowing everything that you know, information that you receive, taken in, and know what to do with, you have your own reality. You know this is reality. But in that person's mind, when he's going through all of these things, and he stopped feeling any emotions, I don't, I don't need to be around. That's his reality. That, How can you break away and, that and person? what do we call that? That is part of that person's what? That's the addiction. Say it. You got it. But the thing is, that's that person's reality. They they don't really see that they're really doing nothing wrong. I know that. I hurt myself. This is what I eat ain't going to make you defecate, so... 
Why are you so worried about me? And, you know what I'm saying? They don't. And that is, they have learned how to that and ask that very question. Every, how do we get through that? Well, that's what we're here for. And then when and you was talking about. Let me life, finish my answer. Yes, sir. That's what we're here doing is how to get through that. And the first most important step in how to get through that is to understand the person's specific dynamics behind that in the first place, and that's what we're doing now. Right. Next semester, we're going to talk about this. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to sneak in here for just a second right now, but we're going to talk about this hedonic calculus and way of doing rational counseling to help this person. But before we can worry about how we're going to get into that, and we need to know what that is. Right. We need to understand this. It's going to be such a unique, very complex, well-developed, and again, don't forget another thing, you guys. No matter how atrocious this looks on the surface, why are they still doing it? Because it's working for them. Right. Kind of a thing. And so, the first step to the answer to your question, how do we... Number one step is what we're doing right now. We need to know who this person is and what are these dynamics with each individual. You need to, instead of focusing on this, you need to start to look at this. What is making this worth it? It's not some cheap ass had fun last night. We're not that stupid. We have to find the unique dynamics behind this behavior for each unique individual. And that's why. I mean, gang, by the time we get done hollering and screaming about how awful everything is, very often, the only thing we really accomplished that day is what? Give them another good reason to want to go get loaded. You see what I'm saying? Wow, you know what? I just sat there spending an hour thinking about how really fucked up I really am. Um, what is that? A tiger! All we've accomplished that day is give them another reason to want to go get loaded. What we need to do is we need to. What is making this worth it? That's why, once again, gang, going that process to the product. What were the experiences that something led up to who that person is that day? Something led up to why this is worth it to this person that day. You see what I'm saying? What were those things about that human individual? Your ability to see that person and experience that person. Your ability to shut off your own judgment and everything and feel that person. Don't forget, this is all in the eyes of the beholder. What could be a major, 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 bad, awful, terrible, I can't say anything to another person is nothing. What could be a major reinforcement to another person is, is, is a nothing. You have to see and feel that individual and find out. I'll be right with you. Like I say, you have to feel that individual so that you, at some point, Get your head out of this and get it here. What is making this worth it? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And then and then if you had another question or another comment also. Question. Right. So are you saying that the counselor can become a tiger? How do you present that? But by you, the counselor, not being a tiger. In other words, don't react to this. Remember what remember and guys, don't forget, you guys very subtle. What did I say? What was the piece of advice I gave you the other day just to start to get in touch with? You even start to learn your nonverbals. I'm sitting here, and once again, I'm looking at this mess of a life you have, and you you make some statement about it. You're acting like it's not that big a deal. How do I respond to that? Just how do I respond? Even nonverbal, how I respond. And then what do I say? How the fuck can that not be bad? Mm -hmm. I just became a tiger. Yeah. I just said, you're stupid. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I just said, you're so fucking stupid. Do you see what I'm saying with that? That's how a counselor becomes a tiger. Uh -huh. How do you not become a tiger? Don't do that kind of stuff. Not sure. and, 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 and watch yourself. Don't be so damn upset about this in the first If you understand this, you don't have to be so upset about it. Of course, they don't seem to be caring that much. Uh -huh. What would you expect? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? No, yeah. Low expectations. Don't. It's not necessarily low expectations. Just have a real understanding of the dynamics behind why that person isn't caring so much. And then you don't have to be so upset about the fact they're not caring so much. That's going to help you understand that person. Does that make sense? 
And you guys, good questions. Yes, uh, did you have another follow up? No, I was going back into you know you saying that not don't worry about the the, uh, the, the problems down there, but go deep into the, the you go negative up here. reinforcers. So learn and discuss what the client's negative reinforcers are. No, don't do that. But you're not gonna. You can't ask the client that. No, I'm not saying. I'm saying learn through their conversation, getting to know them. Get you know what I'm saying. You yes. get as much information as you can from that client, from the past to the now. What's going to shut down that getting that information? Number one, you reacting because you're mad at them. Number two, you're already being judgmental, and so that's exactly right via this interaction with this person discover and that's why gang the process to the product is so damn important should you be ready for them to come with the cognitive distance all the time of should you already be ready i mean even though we he's discussing about his ones twos and threes and, and this is it this is then. just their way of protecting themselves from this this is a way to protect themselves from this right. while they're doing this to protect themselves from that Exactly. Of course, you got to be ready for cognitive dissonance, but and, and what do we call that? Resistance. Right. And oh, by the way, gang, don't forget one of the most eloquent ways to resist is to resist. absolute no resistance. But gang, I do want you to uh, again. How do you not become a tiger for that client? Get in touch with even your nonverbals. Get. It. How do you act when somebody hits your pet peeve? Or pisses you off. How? What? Get in. Have people point this out to you. May not be a lot of fun, but how, how do you react when somebody says something really fucking stupid? You see what I'm saying? So, what? What? What kind? What? What do you do? What kind of a grimace? What kind of a change in eye contact? What kind of a? Do you move forward? What kind of a different look do you? Get in touch with that because all that stuff are going to be things that are going to play a role in the dynamics of this relationship. And if you're sitting there reacting like, I don't have to say you're a fucking idiot. And I can say clearly, just by the way a nonverbal react, say you're a fucking idiot. Can't I? you got to learn about that stuff yourselves, you guys, because you're just humans too. And you don't want to do anything to retard this process. Gang, I'm going to say it again, and then I'm going to probably say it a few more times. And you're going to think at some point, okay, Kels, just said it. No, I'm going to say it some more even. Because this, this right here, this is it right here. If you don't do this right, nothing else you do afterwards matters anyway. And again, this thing, this is where understanding the process of it. Why do we want to go to the past? No, we're not going to sit in the past and cry about it together. What just happened when you were three? Let's cry. No. But you damn well better know what happened and await it. This person is who they are today because of things. Good, bad, right, wrong, or anything else. You see what I'm saying with this? You need to find out what those things are. Why is this such a damn tiger for you? Why? What? What is? How does this? How has the, and that's where, right on top of the process to the product and all those things we talked about. You remember process to the product stuff? Why did I get so into and about making sure you got last semester stuff? You need it, that's why. And then on top of that, the learning, that person's learning history, the subtleties the powerful subtleties of classical conditioning in this person's life experience. What are those little things? All it takes is one little thing. And all of a sudden, they're going the opposite direction. What, 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 is, what is all this culminating in developing a better and better understanding of? Not this. Focusing on this is a waste of time. This, what's making this worth it? That's what's got to be addressed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And again, most of those tigers are going to live where? Right here in that client's head. That's where. I mean, gang, 
Number ones, for example. What's the number one? Somebody tell me. Number one. Ruthings Ruthings the the past. Number one, they alone are tigers. But you realize how a <coughs> person can be at taking a today situation and turning it into a number one? Yes. And don't forget this, gang. Every time. You know, we keep talking about, here's another mistake that counselors make. That happened 27 years ago. When the fuck are you going to... You see what I'm saying? Don't ever forget this. Every time a person uses a one or a two as a way to understand or justify the now, that's no longer 27 years ago. It's right now. Does that make sense? You hear what I'm saying? You wonder how. This, this was 27 years ago and you're still fucking crying about it. Like, yeah, what, when are you going to let it go? You never forget this, you guys. Every time this person uses a one or a two as a way to understand or justify their now, it wasn't 27 years ago no more. It's right now. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so you, how does that play a role? How are they using that? Gang, how are we? And again, we're gonna well, we're gonna answer a whole bunch of that question and, and, and the how do we when we get into this, but I, I just want to give you an example of this right now. How do we take something oh, it wants a drag, it's too bad, but the, the next thing you know it's an attacking tiger. How do we do that? Well, the one little it's our it's what I call it's what I call our cognitive negotiation strategy. How we think ourselves through, how we negotiate the events of our life via the way we think about the events of our life. And we're going to get into, you don't have to write all that down right now, but the, the point of it right now is, I'm going to give you one example. And, and a real, real quick R.E.T. What is it? A is what happens, B is how we think about it, C is how we feel about it. Don't forget, one of the big problems that people have is they think A causes C. What happens, what you said or didn't say, what you did or didn't do, how you did what you did, didn't say, do, not what you said, it's how you said it, and all the other stuff. We have this erroneous belief that what happens causes how we feel. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's, it's in our, the way we talk. Oh, you made me feel so happy. Oh, that made me so fucking mad. We speak that way all the time. And it's what happens causes how we feel. That's one of the first tasks of rational therapy is to get that person to understand that's not the way it works. What happens doesn't cause how you feel. One of the first tasks, one of the how do you break through this things is to help a client stop that and understand. That what happens doesn't cause how I feel. Instead of this, what happens leads to thinking about it. And how we think about it results in how we feel about it. And this is where the problem becomes. Because sometimes what happens isn't all that big of a deal. It's until we get done thinking about it, and then we think it into this horrendous, awful, terrible, unfair, unjust, can't stand it, tiger. You see Isn't what I'm saying? A and C, A to C, classical conditioning, though. Yes, it could be. Yes, yes, yes. What What did we say? That's why we had better be real familiar with their learning history mm -hmm. and classical mm -hmm. conditioning. Exactly, so mm -hmm. that you know what that. That's going to happen all the time. Very. Mm -hmm. good. What we need to look at is this B thing. Now sometimes, do you know this person? Do you know this person? They're an A maker. They are taking things that aren't anything really at all until they think about it and all of a sudden it becomes something. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We're sitting there, what the fuck are you so mad about? Nothing, you know, they thought it really wasn't anything anyway. 
But by the time they get done thinking about it, they made something that wasn't there in the first place. And then we have a escalator. What is an a escalator? Somebody took something minimal and it was, it was it something. Into... Okay, it was something. But by the time they get done with it, it's a hell of a lot more than mm -hmm. it needed to be in the start. But how do you how do you change somebody's perception? Like we're going to that's again the answer is the same thing with Herman. Guess what? Next semester. Ah. That's rational. <laughs> what's the first step? What's the first step in understanding how you change that perception is by doing what we're doing right now, mm -hmm. understanding why that perception is that way and working that way for that person now. So, but the way that's presented, then you're kind of being yourself into an A, which leads to a C. So now you've got B, A, C. That's a nice way to look at it because let <laughs> me continue. And that's because there's that. one more, there's one more A thing. We're gonna get well deep into this again. You guys are gonna meet Albert Ellis next semester and and all this. But the thing is, A makers, A escalators, and then we have, and this is probably the most toxic of them all. The personalizers. That son of a bitch. <laughs> I had to slow down. And my coffee even spilled a little bit because that bastard did not use their turn signal on that interstate exit. And they fucking got up this morning and knew I was going to be there. And they did that just to fuck up my day. Come on. <laughs> really? <laughs> Do you yeah. see that? Really? Really serious? Really? Personally, that becomes sometimes the most toxic aid maker of them all. The most toxic tiger maker of them all. Mm -hmm. We're taking stuff personal. That's what happens with counselors with this stuff right here. That client is just doing what they need to do to feel like they're surviving this. And you're taking it personal. The counselor's taking it personal. It's like that client woke up one day when they were 13 years old, decided to become a junkie, so that one day, nine years later, they could sit Meet in your you office and, make and your ruin life. your fucking day by yeah. not cooperating with what you want to tell me. I and I've it. been doing this for nine years, and I've ruined my life so I can come here today and fuck you yeah. up. Come on, really? Are you see? Do you see what I'm saying? With yeah. That? Yang, we can't. That's what. <laughs> I'm mad at you for doing. Now, if you're a DAX counselor, you're not going to be mad at that client. You're going to understand what mm -hmm. this is and why that client's doing that. That client doesn't know you. They don't care about you. They are protecting themselves from you. You hear what I'm saying? But count that, that this this personal life, this is probably the most toxic of them all. And that's how come counselors get so damn mad at their clients for resistance and stuff. That's why we love to hate clients about that stuff. And then we get all into our tigers, and now all of a sudden, it's no longer about how do I help you, it's about how do I get you to shut your fucking mouth and let me feel like I know what I'm talking about here. I'm in charge, you know. You see what I'm saying with this? That we fall prey to that. That client... They, they don't understand what I'm trying to tell them, and I'm taking it personal, like they're trying to fuck with me. I, you do understand it. Is that where you want to be right now, counselor? If you understand this, you won't have to fall prey to that. Why is that client acting that way? Because that's how the brain works, because that's the best they can do right now to survive. You know, that's what that, what we call what I call, when I teach this, and we're going to do this next semester also, the no bad client ideal. Instead of focusing on all these damn things this damn client is doing to, whether it's because they're not listening to me or whatever else they're doing, they're so self defeating and everything else, and then we get so damn mad at that stuff. Well, we've got to understand, no bad client. What does that mean? And oh, by the way, I'm not, I'm not sticking my head in the ground. No. What... The events of the situation are not going to work for recovery, but we need to understand that in a way that what we understand is whatever that client is doing, no matter how bad, self-defeating, illogical, irrational, however, my, we, this, that, or anything else, we need to understand whatever that client is doing right now, it's their best attempt at survival. And then the task is, what is it they're trying to survive right now? How come I am being somebody they need 
they are thinking. What am I doing right now that is making you feel like you need to protect yourself from me? You understand? That's the counselors. Wait. If that client's getting all crazy, nutty, full of resistance and everything, what you need to ask yourself is, what am I, the counselor, doing right now that's making that client think they need to protect themselves from me? Does that make sense? Do you hear what I'm saying with that? And then I better take that responsibility, own that, and change that real fast. And that's where, once again, you guys, even the little itty bitty subtleties, have a best friend, a partner, somebody tell you, point out, you know what, there you went again. And you're not going to like hearing it, oh, fuck it. But still, <laughs> help yourself become avail available to your little subtle thing. That's all it takes sometimes. I mean, every person in this room, at least once in your life, the only thing that happened was a nonverbal facial or other thing from that other person and off to the races we went, right? Mm -hmm. That's how powerful that stuff can be. Don't be doing that in your counseling session. So that's, that. do you hear what I'm saying? Well, I'm talking about clients, counselors, and everybody else here, aren't I? We counselors do the same damn thing because we get mad at our clients for the things that we ought to understand what the hell am I mad at that client for here? That's what, with motivational interviewing, that's what roll with resistance means. Instead of fight it, get mad at it, learn from it. Do you realize how much information you can get about this person? Just by understanding when, how, why, what, in terms of that person's resistance. You see what I'm saying with this stuff? That's what's so important with this. Now, let's get back to this for a minute. Again, another example of how. Why is this person's life so full of tigers in the first place? Because they are tiger makers. Why? Well, that's probably going to be related to the things that happened in their process to the product. How did they learn? How is it? What happened in this person's life that this thing has to represent such a scary thing to that person right now? Is it tied to ones and twos? Could be. Is it tied to other circumstances, situations, classical conditioning? Do you remember that whole gang? This is a, what did I remember when we talked about last semester? Never forget that stuff. Remember we talked about the whole high school thing? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I said it then. I'm gonna say it again. And the context of this, what we're doing right now. I don't care if it's a drug alcohol problem or some other problem or this or that or anything else. I don't care what the age is. I don't care. They got to be old enough to have gone through that. But I, I don't care why they're there, what the problem is, what this, what that or anything else. If I'm going to help that person, I'm going to want to know a whole, whole, whole bunch about what happened in this person's life uh, right here in this period of their life. It is such a formative so much of what becomes that person's enduring personality is taking place right there in those years. That process to the product. Today, I have this 27, 31, 42 year old person sitting in my office in the midst of this. One of the best ways to understand, why is this such a big, why is this, why would it do is to understand. I'm going to want to know as much as I can about this, about that person. Does that make sense? And other things like that. How and why? Why is this such a big deal to this person? Why is this something now that they have turned into a tiger? That now makes getting away from that tiger worth this cost. Do you hear what I'm saying with this stuff, you guys? Yes. That's starting to happen earlier too. Like I, sure. in our time, our time as counselors, as kids grow, my son's in sixth grade and he's already talking about the popular kids and there you go. where he fits right. in that. And I'm already explaining to him Maslow and he's looking at me like I'm a lunatic, but I feel like if you can understand that this happens in everybody's life, maybe he'll have a better grasp of it and where he will fit and, and we'll, be okay. I think you're, and you're absolutely, it is happening earlier. 
because of social media yes. and new demands mm -hmm. and all this other stuff mm -hmm. and kids are growing up fast and because parents want their kids to grow up faster mm -hmm. you know and, and all that other kind of stuff and everything else yeah this you know this used to be high school this used to be sophomore junior high school mm -hmm. and then it became freshman sophomore and then it became eighth grade so freshman and then it became seventh grade eighth grade now it's sixth grade one of these days these kids are gonna dang and what were these do you want remember when we belabored this mm -hmm. and what were some of those things hey the beginnings of that person's cognitive dissonance resolution strategy the power that has regarding that person's sense of both self and outcome efficacy the importance this has in terms of how this person learns how to interpret those events and their life and understanding and giving meaning so much if you're going to understand what we're talking about right now in this assessment instead of focusing on this which is not going to work we've got to focus on this that means we've got to find out what this is and one of the best ways to understand why something did it, why is this I'm, I'm saying I, think I wouldn't I wouldn't worry a plug nickel over this but this seems to be this dictatorially dishonest in your life right now why is that what where did this whatever it is take on that level of significance where did this whatever it is right now how did that become so powerfully bad in your life you see what I'm saying and again one example of how we do this we conjure our own tigers a and, and we're, I, I promise we're gonna get way deep into this next I'm just, this is just to make this one point right now a what happens be how we think about it see how we feel don't forget a doesn't cause C it's how we think about it yeah what are a maker a escalator personal right and then we have two levels of B how we think about it a, a quick little how about an example I call her up and ask her to go to dinner tonight, and she says no first level of B I how dare she said no who the fuck does she think she thinks she's better than me or what I can't believe that she said no I don't like that and I can't believe now that could be enough to spark off something you see what I'm saying now I'm feeling bad because how dare it? Who does she think she is? Wait, she thinks she's better than me? What, you see, that kind of a thing like that. What's wrong with me that she would want to say no? But then, and this is what we do, gang, and this is where it hooks up with the process to the product, and especially those ones and twos. We take that level of thinking to a next step, and this is where. And this is what you need to listen, 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 and hear this. And oh, by the way, you know the best way to listen to a client? Shut up. Keep your damn mouth shut. Stop trying to shove that crap down their throat and everything else and your values and everything. Shut up. If you want to hear that client. And gang. Yeah, that first level B, I'm thinking, I can't believe she said no. How dare she said no. Who did she think she's better than me? Well, that's going to lead to some not great feelings, right? But then what happens? But I mean, really, is somebody going to go out drinking tonight because she said no? Yeah. Well, Maybe. yeah. Yeah. That's very possible. <laughs> In and of it itself. Is. Yes. But then we take it where it becomes even worse. <coughs> this is where, gang, you're going to see this second level of B that's going to be very much tied to. And since she said no, that means everybody's going to say no all the time. Because I'm a worthless, ugly person who nobody wants to be with, and I am going to die alone. All of a sudden, what happened? You, you called somebody up, asked them to dinner, and they said no. The next thing you know, you're dying alone. How did that happen? You see, do you see what I'm, do, do you see what I'm saying with this? And gang, by the time I've got done with, the next thing you know, I'm dying alone. Well, I know how not to be alone. There's a bunch of drunks over there at that bar. I'll just fuck this. You see what I'm saying? Do you see how that works? And gang, I mean, this stuff, our cognitive, yeah, I, I don't like she said no. And in fact, I'm kind of pissed off about it. 
That's what, and is that enough to take, is that, for some people, yeah. But then when we end up at that second level, the next thing, because she said no, that means everybody's going to say no because I'm ugly and stupid and nobody will ever want to be with me and I am going to die alone. And then we're sitting there wondering, how come you're so upset? Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If we don't let ourselves hear that second level B processing, we're never going to understand why they're so damn up. You see what I'm saying? You've got to hear that second level B processing. One of the best ways to understand that second level B uh, process is to understand this and understand the process to the product. Why? Why, why is that person, fr she said no and I'm going to die alone now. What the hell, did, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. To that person, it happened very logically. How come that is the way it's working? You need to know the person well enough to know how. She said no turns into I'm going to die alone. You understand what I'm saying with that? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that. Who wouldn't? All of a sudden, here, here I am. I'm 27 years old, and I'm going to die alone. Well, what the fuck did? And then I'm going to want to talk to you about what you're going to lose in life. You just threw it all away. Because you're going to die alone. Because, do you see what I'm You guys, and yes, I'm exaggerating this to make the point, but do you hear what I'm saying? This is what you need to know here. Most of everything we're talking about right now, unless they're a DAC counselor, they would have no idea what the hell we're talking about here right now. You know what I'm saying? And then you wonder why we think we're big shots at 18% success. You know what I'm saying? Let's take a break. I like your energy today, Kelps. I'm digging it.